Meine sehr geehrten Damen und Herren, ich begrüße Sie wieder allmählich. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome you slowly but surely back from break at the conference Forest and Moon in Hands. We will start now with the announced panel discussion with the stakeholder dialogue on the topic gender equality and the forestry sector. The discussion of ladies will be led by a man, namely Alexander Bock. He's executive director of EU for Austria, had studied forestry and law and is uh, a, a special expert on forests, uh, environment, and uh, resource policy. Alexander Bock has always been at the in, active on interfaces, at the interface between science and politics, at the interface between uh, public and private sector. And today he is our interface between forest, between women and men, Many of you may know Alexander personally. We know all of them. He will uh, lead this discussion in a very sovereign and, and charming way. At this point, I would like to pass on to you, dear Alexander. Thank you very much for the very kind introduction, Hermine. Good afternoon, good morning, and good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to this stakeholder dialogue on connecting and engaging women in the forest-based sector. I'm truly delighted that so many of you have joined this conference and take part in this stakeholder dialogue. Looking at the list of participants, we can see that more than 250 participants from a multitude of countries, and I believe all regions of the world, have connected uh, to this conference, uh, have connected virtually. As has already been mentioned very kindly by Hermine, my name is Alexander Buck, and I am the Executive Director of UFRO, the International Union of Forest Research Organizations. Um, and by now we have already heard quite a bit about IUFRO, as has been highlighted by Professor Liedestaff in her keynote presentation. It is truly important to understand and identify prevailing gender-related barriers and to take effective action to overcome such barriers. It is a strategic goal of UFRO to promote gender equality in our global network and more generally to further diversify participation in UFRO structure, for instance, also in terms of culture and geography. I'm pleased to say that currently about 40% of scientists holding offices in IUFRA are female. And at the moment, UFRO is preparing a major step to significantly improve the gender balance of its main governing body, the board. Ladies and gentlemen, as has been stated in the opening of this conference, a significant share of force is in women's hands, the very motto of this conference. Yet women continue to be significantly underrepresented in forestry institutions and lack visibility uh, in the sector. Therefore, it is, uh, I'm delighted to say that in the stakeholder dialogue, we will hear from a panel representing forest policy, practice and academia about their own experiences and discuss with them how to achieve more equal opportunities for women in the forest sector. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you will allow me to briefly introduce our panelists and I will do so in an alphabetical order. Is the Alina Lekoinen is the president of the International Forestry Students Association, IFSA, which is the largest international network of students in forestry and related science, sciences. And as such, it's kind of a very nice complement also to the UFRO network. Um, she's also a member of the Youth in Landscapes, the YIL Steering Committee. Alina is an undergraduate studying for sciences at the University of Helsinki. And I should like to mention, Alina, that you are also an accomplished entrepreneur running your own successful local business in the forestry field. A very warm welcome, Alina. Our second panelist uh, is uh, Professor Gun Liedestaff. Uh, and Gun has already been introduced as the keynote speaker of this conference. Uh, therefore, with your permission, Gun, I will be very brief 
and just mention that you are an associate professor at the Swedish University of Agriculture Sciences and that you are coordinating the UFRO task force on gender equality in forestry. Uh, welcome, uh, Gun. Next, uh, Beth McNeil. And we are truly delighted to have Beth with us as a panelist. Beth McNeil is the Assistant Deputy Minister of Natural Resources Canada and its Canadian Forest Service. And I believe, Beth, that means that you are the highest ranking forester in the country, right? Um, Beth has spent more than 25 years working in science-based economic and regulatory departments across the federal government, including the Canadian Wildlife Service, Fisheries and Oceans Canada, and Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. Beth holds a Bachelor of Science in Biology from STFX University in Nova Scotia, a Master Degree in Environmental Studies from York University in Toronto, and a Certificate in Public Sector Leadership and Governance from the University of Ottawa. A very good morning and a very warm welcome to you, Beth. Andrea Pirka is a forest owner and a forest manager. In addition, uh, good afternoon, Andrea. In addition to managing her own agricultural and forestry business, she's also a consultant for other forestry businesses, inspector in the organic sector, and a court certified expert. Moreover, she is a sworn forestry hunting and fishing inspector. And if all that were not yet enough, uh, she is also in her surrounding in her surroundings working as the gamekeeper. Importantly for this conference, Andrea is also a founding member of First Frauen Austria, one of the organizers of this conference. And Andrea, you are a mother of four children. A very warm welcome, Andrea. Renate Speed is a forest officer at the Ministry of Environment, Agriculture, Conservation and Consumer Protection of the state of North Rhine-Westphalia in Germany. Uh, good afternoon, Renate. Renate, uh, I believe I'm not wrong in saying that you were the first female forest officer at the ministry. Um, Renate has been involved in activities related to gender equality, both within Germany and at the international level for several decades, for instance, as a member of the UNEC FAO team of specialists on gender and forestry. Renate holds a degree in forest engineering from the University of Applied Sciences in Göttingen. And last, but certainly not, and a warm welcome also to you, Renate. And last, but certainly not least, Berta Stashkova, Berta is the head of a company called Woodlander SRO in Slovakia. She is also the managing director of the NGO Lesna Pedagogica, and I'm not sure, Berta, if I pronounced that properly, which is actively dedicated to forest education and forest bathing. For eight years, she was also active as the chairperson of the East Slovak Forestry Chamber. Berta produces and sells wild herb syrups and other local specialities. Quite amazing. And Berta, you are the mother of two children. You studied forestry at the Technical University in Swollen and also at Göttingen University. A very warm welcome also to you, Berta. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, you can find the biographical information about our panelists also in the program booklet of this conference. Ladies and gentlemen, let me briefly outline the procedure for this dialogue. We, will, we are running slightly behind schedule and will have little less than two hours in total for our stakeholder dialogue. In the first round, we will hear from each panelist about their own experiences and what can be learned from those experiences. In the second round, we will aim at diving a bit deeper and explore what the panelists uh, see as the main bottlenecks, but also the factors of support for women in forestry. And uh, participants, it will then be your turn as participants to ask questions or make comments before we will wrap up the discussion with a final round of statements by the panelists. Colleagues, let us now go straight into the panel discussion with the first round of questions. I would like to ask all panelists uh, to limit your, your answers to about five minutes. 
I do have this sand clock to check the time. You may not see it, but once the sand has run through the sand glass, I will actually let you know about it and alert you that you have used up the time for the first round of statements. Uh, as your contributions are going to be interpreted simultaneously between English and German languages, I ask you to speak slowly and clearly. And actually, even I should have spoken more slowly and clearly up to now. You can use either of the two languages, English or German. I would like to start with our two forest practitioners, if I may say so, Andrea and Bertha, and ask the following question. As someone representing forest practitioners, what is your experience regarding the engagement of women in this area? And are there perhaps any activities and experiences that you would like to highlight? Who wants to go first? Ja, einmal herzlichen Dank auch von meiner Seite. Herzlichen Dank an alle. Ja. Thank you very much on my part. Wie gesagt, ich bin die Praktikerin in der from practice in this round. I grew up on the mountain farm with two sisters and of course the profile has resulted to take over a farm and from the female point of view, this was at that time if one or the other has not wished it, but nevertheless I, I, I did it. But of course this was an inherited uh, behavior pattern, but I had a bit like that I had a grandfather who has always uh, confirmed me and said, you can do, get everything you want. And also my father who, who guided me through the hard school of forestry. And so I was a uh, timber work, woodworker uh, and, and statistics and, and, and uh, and, and I learned everything and also how to work. And, and then I found out that I belong as a woman to, to forestry. I was not happy. And then I decided to make the master of forestry. And then in the course of this training, I became aware of the fact that the conservative traditional forestry and to see them and to take note of them. And then I became aware of the fact that, that uh, with an active woman with the chainsaw, uh, it's not an easy life in forestry, but as it was my wish and my way, I, I nobody could make me change. And subsequently, when I've... Uh, got into the first sector. Also my four children uh, educated as a good mother and uh, managed an enterprise and made fit for the next generation. It was not enough for me. And from forest hunting pedagogics, I also uh, became member of uh, one or the other forestry bodies. And Due to the generation contract, it is not uh, foreseen that as far as the woman you're in public when you're bound to the ground. But this was not me, this was not my person. It has also been important to me to be seen and, and to mark the picture of women in, in agriculture and forestry. And I think something, I've succeeded in something. And uh, I've also uh, been working in the field of, of, of tending and, and wildlife uh, tending. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrea, for sharing uh, these experiences with us. Um, I realized that you mentioned your grandfather, that you had a, a, an important role model quite early on, and you mentioned also other very important factors. Berta, for you as another forest practitioner, now having heard, you know, uh, Andrea's observations and insights, can I ask you, do these also reflect your own experiences? Sicher gerne. 
einiges wird. Ich denke bei vielen. I think some things will be similar. My father is forester, my older sister is for forester, my husband is forester, my brother in law is forester, my uncle was forester, so my way was clear. I'm happy to have joined this path and I never regretted it. Of course, in my professional life, there have been moments where I had to, to decide. But this is uh, something everybody has, not only first. It took several years, after some years in forestry. I started from working in office to real practice. But for me personally, this was important. Everybody should find its place, not only professional and then then he takes decisions and then he makes a turn and she feels where sees where she can feel fine where, whether she wants to work among men where she's able to manage them where she feels fine in this role for me this was the case i'm working in a society which offers services in, in forestry and hunting. And I'm working exclusively with men. But in my life, in my professional life, I've recognized that I try to find a balance by concentrating on forestry education and pedagogics. And forest bathing is also an aspect, soft activities, which I, I needed as a woman. I think that women has an important role. We need self-confident and satisfied women. They feel fine in a typical male territory, and then they can make a high contribution, not only in office. We as women should, I think, try to, to suppress our natural conditions, but we should base them with our access we can take the right position if we want it. Uh, of course, there can be obstacles in this way, on our way. And then it is important and, and it is right to deal with them and to talk about them. This don't have to be easy thing. Sexual harassment is not an easy topic, but I'm sure that only in the USA and not only actresses have a, uh, a confronted with this problem. This was only my also my experience, and we should also talk about that and to find ways to to deal with this problem and to solve this problem. I thought in which way this could be solved, how, what could be ways and means. And I think one should in future, at the right of the love estate of a forest woman, at the university, at the beginning, at the technical schools, forestry faculties, we could talk about that and to provide support to the young women to, and all via such events as this one in order to ensure that the young women feel support and then be able to, to select the right positions and be satisfied forest women and work 
on the right positions and, and can grow. Thank you so much, Beata. The two of us uh, had the opportunity to discuss a little bit before this conference. And then you said that it is really important when discussing, you know, experiences of women in the forest-based sector to also speak out on the less pleasant experiences, including, uh, you know, uh, the, the really very significant problem of sexual harassment. So therefore, I'm very glad that you did so and that you also brought up this very important subject matter in this discussion, in this dialogue. So thank you very much, Berta. Alina, we have now heard from Andrea and Berta about their experiences. You are, as we have heard, a student of forestry. And I wonder, after what we have heard now, what can actually motivate young people in general and women in particular to choose a forest-related education, education, and engage in the forest-based sector? Uh, thank you, Alexander. I think that's a good question and one we should really address uh, to ensure we have a future in the forestry field. Um, I think one very major important thing is that there isn't a lot of knowledge among high school students about forestry when they are picking where to apply to universities and what they want to do after high school. Um, and so they think often that um, that forestry is very one dimensional, that forestry is just exploiting forests and um, this very often masculine thing where people go to forest and cut down trees. But as we know, that's not what forestry is. Forestry will, for, the forestry field is very wide and there are a lot of opportunities, whether you want to go into exploitation or economics or policy or science or whatever you want to do, it's very interdisciplinary. And there are a lot of things to do in forestry. Um, I, try to speak, I try to speak globally when I uh, talk about things today as I'm, um, as I'm from the International Forestry Students Association. But one thing uh, that has been happening in Finland uh, for the past five, ten years um, is that we have really raised uh, numbers of applicants uh, um, and students and especially female students in forestry. So when I uh, started in university five years ago, uh, our course was about 50-50. Uh, before that, it had been male dominated, and after that, it has become little by little female dominated. And what happened is that uh, is that um, the university started advertising, the faculty started adv advertising forestry to high school students, both in social media as well as they sent. Um, volunteer uh, students back to their old high schools to tell about forestry. And that way, that has been, that has made a major change. Um, we are getting incredibly high numbers of applicants. And um, it's really wonderful for me to see that there is this surge of interest in, in forestry again. Uh, among young people and women, especially. Thank you very much, Alina, for sharing with us this experience, this rather encouraging experience, I would say, about really uh, how to open up this kind of very narrow perception of forestry as being a very narrow field, which, as we all know, is not true, is not an accurate depiction of forestry. Um, ultimately, any measures in a forestry practice and in forest education uh, to uh, achieve more equal opportunities for women depend on support uh, by appropriate policy means. And therefore, very glad to have with us two representatives from government. And if you allow me, I would like to start with Beth McNeil and ask the following question. Um, Beth, uh, can I ask what is being done 
about the gender bias that currently exists and how do we address some of those systemic barriers in the forest sector. So kindly share with us your experience from Canada. Yes, thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Very well. Great, thank you. Um, well, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning with such uh, wonderful and experienced accomplished panelists. Um, within Canada, there's still much work to be done. And the government of Canada has made diversity and inclusion a priority and is taking steps to improve its assessment of systemic inequalities. We want to better understand how women, men, and gender diverse people experience our federal government policies and programs. And we have a process called Gender-Based Analysis Plus. Now I must admit, uh, this process was once considered an add-on to our policy program and budget proposals, but now it's actually a key initial assessment of possible biases and implications regarding key factors such as gender, age, education, income. And we also have to include indicators and monitor performance of those new programs and policies that we implement and fund. I'll give you a couple of concrete examples that um, are, are occurring within Natural Resources Canada. Our department has shown itself to be a leader, I think, in gender-related issues. And the ex senior executives in our department uh, established a charter of gender equality the first of its kind in the federal government. And it outlines concrete measures for detecting biases, recruiting and supporting women in reaching their full potential. And we promote uh, women's career progression once they are in the system. And we identify uh, and support leadership opportunities. And within my program area, I have a number of forest sector competitiveness programs. And here I'm actually using these programs as a tool to create change, a changing culture within the industrial side of the forest sector in Canada, because I've heard of the barriers in my position. I've heard of the barriers and um, the biases in forest operations and on the mill floors right along the full value chain. So we've implemented our own measures to identify representation gaps and improve workforce diversity. In Canada, about 16% of the workforce is made up of women. For instance, gender and diversity have become embed embedded in our federal funding. So if a program and a CEO of a company is successful in receiving federal funds, I now have a tool that says you must develop a diversity and, and uh, inclusion plan, human resources plan, and you have to report on that to me. And this will be monitored and we'll do surveys and it will influence the success of their applications going forward. And I'm also going to apply this um, and it's already publicly posted. But in Canada, we have committed to planting 2 billion trees to help reduce our GHG emissions. And in that uh, 2 billion tree program, which starts this spring, again, uh, we have brought diversity and inclusion to the forefront of that program. We have also used our federal programming, working with our National Research Council to establish scholarships for women who are in a forest related field to encourage them to go on in that field and, and potentially um, leadership positions. And one interesting project I'd like to highlight, a couple of years ago in one of my forest research centers in Edmonton, Alberta, two women designed a bursary and mentoring program that pairs our indigenous women in Canada. So First Nations, Métis and Inuit women and non-Indigenous women. They're at the university and college level, and it pairs them in forestry and other natural resource sectors. And through their research, each pair has access to a mentor who can provide assist assistance, and this mentor will help navigate different government procedures and provide scientific expertise to help them along their way. 
the intent of this initiative is to give women an opportunity to develop a network, to grow their leadership and teamwork skills and foster positive relationships between Canada's Indigenous people and non-Indigenous women in their communities. And I'm very pleased with the outcome and we're expanding it now to the mining sector as well as the clean energy sector. So what I'm trying to do is use my position as Assistant Deputy Minister and the tools I have to make sure we create a culture that uh, is more inclusive, but also resilient for women. Thank you. Thank you so much, Beth, for sharing with us this full range of programs and initiatives in Canada, in Canada to promote gender equality. Renate, you have been involved in policy discussions about gender issues, both in Germany and also at the international level for several decades. Allow me to ask, what are your experiences in this regard? Thank you very much, uh, Alexander. Vielen Dank. And um, a big thank you for the organizers for inviting me to this, to my eyes, very important conference. Why I think it is important right now at this moment in 2021, I would like to explain by taking a very short look back. It seems from the previous inputs that the year 2000 marks a kind of milestone to questions of women in forestry Uh, and gender issues. 20 years ago, in April 2001, the FAO ECE ILO Committee on Forest Technology Management and Training held a very important first seminar on women in forestry in Viseu, Portugal. I would like to suggest uh, to the audience to draw attention to the conclusions and Uh, recommendations of this seminar and to the actions that have been 20 years ago addressed to the member countries. One important conclusion was that it has been increasingly recognized that forestry is not only about trees and forests, but also about people. Forestry therefore needs both men and women. Awareness of this fact and of the contributions women could and should make to forestry is still very low among male foresters. Some of you have uh, pointed that out uh, 20 years later now. And upon decision makers. And I would like to add among forest owners. The almost total disregard for women is a serious handicap for the whole forestry sector. One important recommendation for legislation and programs suggested strongly to implement positive and deliberate steps towards equality and adherence to them monitored. The measures should provide for transparent selection and promotion procedures. The forestry sector as a whole should explicitly include a gender dimension in policies and strategies, such as national forestry programs, or such like Beth pointed out, and encourage the participation of women in all areas. From 2001 on, gender issues in forestry have been raised in our ministry. Gender studies have been conducted as well um, in forestry as in nature conservation areas. A female forest owners network was started in 2002 with the help of our ministry and uh, the forest administration in Nordrhein-Westfalen and in the following years in Bavaria. A national female forest officers network was already established in the 1980s when I was a student. There were a lot of efforts to bring these issues of women in forestry and gender to the federal forest policy level in Germany. There was impetus to raise the question in our national forest program and national forest discussions. 
but unfortunately without any visible results up to now. While until 2010 and 15, it seemed to me as if there was growing awareness in the forest administrations and in the forestry sector uh, to these questions, I have the, um, the feeling that now we have, uh, we, we are experiencing a kind of backlash because there are other more important issues to discuss. And this is why I think that this conference is so very important, at least to the German speaking uh, countries. And I think that uh, you have done very well uh, to grab the opportunity for this conference. Um, concluding, I would like to add with some personal experience of myself. I was born and raised in a very small village in Nordrhein-Westfalen, in the country where I now work for, for almost 35 years. Um, and I have, I come from a, a part of German, of Nordrhein-Westfalen where the forests are owned as forest commons. It's not the private, um, private ownership, uh, like, uh, we are used to talk about, but, um, uh, Gunnlide staff and I, we have a very long connection, not uh, only about um, gender and forestry, but also about forest commons. And um, I have been the first child of five in um, a family of timber traders. My great grandfather and grandfather, they traded timber to the uh, coal mining business, the very important one in Europe to the Ruhr area. And it wasn't uh, especially my grandfather or my father uh, who supported me because my dad very young, but it has been my mother, my grandmothers, and my great grand aunts and aunts. So I have been very, very lucky that I always was in the position to do what I wanted to do. Uh, but I have experienced all uh, the challenges that some of the panelists have uh, pointed out. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Renate. And I think we all agree that we want to make decisive and lasting progress towards making gender equality and equity a reality. Therefore, I'm really sorry to hear from you that in your perception there has even been a backlash uh, in terms of uh, awareness about uh, the importance of gender equality. Gun, uh, we have already heard quite a bit uh, from you. Uh, therefore, perhaps, and also because we are a little bit constrained by time, I could uh, ask you to be as uh, uh, focused as possible. But now that you have heard about the all these experiences by our colleagues um, in forest to practice government and studies, would you say, Gun, that these experiences confirm what science also tells us? Yes. <laughs> that, that was very <laughs> that was very brief, Gun. Do you want me to expand please, please, it a bit? That was that was perhaps too brief. <laughs> okay. Please expand. Um, uh, yes. Um, uh, but still, the the. Um, uh, the bottom line is uh, yes, there, because different in different countries and also different org types of organizations uh, are dealing with gender uh, quite differently or gender equality issues. Um, and um, to some extent, uh, we already have some theories that can explain why. Uh, some theories we can bring in from, from other fields of research, I mean, uh, in society, because this doing of gender or our conceptions of what gender is and what gender does um, is rather universal in some sense. Um, what I think is, uh, and, and I hope I was clear about this in my keynote, that uh, in many occasions now, we are moving uh, from understanding gender as something that 
um, only individuals do in relation to other individuals, but uh, rather now to understand that organizations also do gender uh, in the way how they recruit, how they promote and um, define competence in, uh, in different aspects. And, um, <clears throat> and this is, on one hand, I'm a bit sad to say that one of my experience is that um, universities or the, uh, the academic institutions are among the less progressive ones. Uh, let's say in their, how they as an organization do and understand gender. Um, and um, now I'm speaking, let's say, basically on, on um, institutions and universities with a, a science, natural science background. Because when I look across the campus here at uh, from where we are, the Faculty of Forestry to the University of Umeå. Uh, then there are uh, those who are very specialist in gender studies and they have research schools on gender studies and so forth. So um, we are happy that we can learn from, from that. Um, what has been more problematic is actually that um, we are not actually, I mean, as a, as, as a university or, or uh, research groups, we are not that attractive. We are not able to attract those specialists in those fields because um, we are not trained enough in this sense. Um, and I think that this is where we really can do better. Uh, I mean, in the sense that we are more open to a dialogue uh, and to include uh, other professions into our fields. And uh, yes, so uh, back to this, if there are some progress, on one hand, there are really some progress. Uh, at, um, at the moment, we are actually uh, we have started for the third year to to give a course for our forestry students on uh, on gender competence. Uh, it's voluntarily, but um, still there are some 20, 25 students that uh, that uh, apply and and uh, do think that this competence uh, will make them better as professionals and it will improve their ability also to get a a nice job. Um, on the other hand, what we experienced in 2017, um, which I mentioned, was the Me Too uh, movement that really hit the, the forestry sector in Sweden very hard and, and revealed that we, in many ways, were so unaware of uh, problems, including sexual harassments. Yeah, I stopped there. Thank you very much, Kun. And if I'm not misinformed, I think there has been a, a sort of a Me Too movement in Sweden in order to counter these cases of sexual harassment, right? Yes, uh, I, I, as I mentioned very briefly in my keynote, uh, this NYXT, uh, an organization for professional, women professional in, in forestry and binary, those also identify them as binary. Um, uh, it, was, uh, it was established in response to this, um, I would say. And they are very active. And they also get a lot of, nowadays, they get a lot of, of let's say, um, uh, recognition. Um, and they have taken on uh, what I uh, tried to explain, uh, a strategy where they both try to escape this, uh, this trap of being particular or um, stand out as particular, 
because on the same time you want to be universal, you want to be part of this workforce. So their strategy is, um, I would say, more clear than most other networks. And um, yeah, so th that is, that was if uh, the Me Too movement turned out in some way to not be a backlash, but reveal a backlash or uh, the effect and the more long-term effect was two steps forward, I think. I hope. Yeah. Thank you very much, Gun. Uh, dear panelists, colleagues, um, your experiences, I think it's fair to say that your experiences show that there continue, be, continue to be very significant uh, barriers for creating more equal opportunities for women in forestry. Yet all of you have already also alluded to some important factors of support. So let us now make an effort to dive a bit deeper and discuss those limitations and factors of support in a bit more detail. And if you allow me, I would again start with our two forestry practitioners, Anna and Bertha. You, both of you do have very successful careers in forestry, yet you all, both of you also mentioned that you encountered significant uh, difficulties. From your point of view, what have been the major limitations, the major tumbling blocks on the roads that you were encountering, but what has also helped you advance in your professional careers? Or in other words, what do female forest owners and practitioners need and how can they best be supported? Um, perhaps this time I could ask you to go first. Would, would that be okay? Of course. Uh, as I have already mentioned, I believe that we should start with ourselves. And by this, I mean that the problem can be due to the wrong, um, can be due to choosing the wrong profession or course of profession. Not every woman necessarily has to has to has to choose um, a job as desired some women can also be comfortable in the office or I don't want to give this as a bad example but it there do not necessarily have to be practice-oriented forest professions. We as the women have ma many features and benefits where we can make very much progress in the forestry. And choosing the right thing for us is the most important thing for us. It took some years for me personally. And as I've just said, I think that what was not possible for me or maybe 20 years ago or 15 years ago, I did not have the opportunity or maybe I wasn't looking for it to look for help and advice from organizations that could help women to help them understand themselves better and to make their voices heard and not be afraid to voice their opinion when something is annoying them or when they need help. This does not always have to be simple. I believe there is a huge room for improvement to forge networks or on a national level to collaborate with universities to show up better ways for young women, especially. Andrea, what do you think? <laughs> Thank you very much. 
I have made experience, then especially in the forest-based sector, but also in the practical, in practice, you, at the beginning, you are, um, they, I have experienced that they have asked um, after my hectares and you find yourself in categories. Practically speaking, it has always been the case for me that I had to be better in terms of education, but also in terms of logistics and make myself hurt. It was a long way and, of course, not a very easy one. But I have enjoyed a very strict um, it, it was very hard for me to, to accept, but you're tied to your profession. You cannot take this on your shoulders and do anything to make myself visible to the outside world. Of course, this may be easier when you're in institutions or are part of them. If I want to be seen and heard, I will need to be active and take action. I also believe that it is not enough to be a damsel in mistress. I think it needs a lot of endurance to position oneself. I have made the experience that I was asked the size of my property at many events. And then I was taken seriously or frowned upon or con they were condescending toward me. I had to train myself to not let this get to me on a personal level, but be on a meta level, to be above it all. But I've also made good experiences. When I looked at my counterpart, I thought, well, they cannot start a chainsaw. They cannot disembowel wild game. And this is how you gain strength to continue and also to communicate on an eye-to-eye -eye level, which was very important to me. I have not always managed to do so. It was not always satisfying when going home, but I tried to work on it and use a different strategy the next time. I think we as women have the potential to take holistic approaches in the forest-based sectors, in logistics or whatever field it is, but also assume leading positions. But I do believe that we need to consider if we're doing this to 100% and then are visible. I think this is where we have to get ourselves out of this inherit, inherited behavioral patterns to step forward consciously and saying, yes, we are here, we have knowledge, we do have it, but we need to be honest to ourselves. This is probably, I would like to say, one of our weaknesses. We are perceiving ourselves as too little important. We're not taking ourselves seriously enough. We need to go out and say, here we are. But as long as we are not doing this, it will keep being difficult. I think this is something we all can work on. Thank you so much. And uh, sorry for cutting you a bit short, but I think we can state with confidence that you personally did that very successfully um, in being a co-founder of First Frauen, of the First Frauen Network in Austria. And I think it's also fair to say that the network itself actually has uh, achieved a lot in terms of making women in forestry more visible 
in Austria and also abroad. Alina, if I'm not mistaken, the majority of IFSA presidents in the past decade or so, and that's actually also the time span I can think back, <laughs> I've been working with IFSA, uh, so the majority of IFSA presidents in that long time span have actually been women. And the structures of IFSA have always been characterized by the balanced representation of women and men. Why do you think, Alina, has IFSA been so successful in terms of gender equality? Well, uh, to answer that, I will have to speculate a little bit because we have never properly looked into it. We don't have, <laughs> we don't have any definite answers, but um, I have been thinking about it. And uh, probably at least one of the reasons is that things that we value a lot in IFSA for, and uh, like soft skills and networking are, um, are often more common interests for women. Uh, and so, so, so IFSA might be uh, able to attract more women like that, um, even though they are, of course, important skills for everyone. Um, but I hope that like I am very happy that IFSA, uh, IFSA is so gender balanced and that many students get to see women in leadership positions even during their uh, student years. Um, um, so I'm, I'm very happy about how it looks and uh, that we are so gender balanced. But as I said, I, I don't have any definite answers. <laughs> No, thank you, Alina. But I think in any case, one can really say that IFSA has been a great model and has been providing and continues to provide great encouragement to young people, um, and especially to, to young women in forestry. Now I would again like to turn to our two uh, government representatives. Um, Beth and Renate, you have both already highlighted some of the more systemic barriers and also um, some of the factors of support. Um, we have now heard a lot about uh, the importance of networking, about the importance of mentoring, peer-to-peer uh, -peer learning and so on. But the question is, is all that enough? Um, isn't the, 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 the pace of progress that we are making a bit too slow? And therefore, is it not necessarily necessary to also take more affirmative action? So I wonder what you think about this. Uh, and I wonder who would like to go first. <laughs> Renate, please. Uh, yes, uh, thank you again. Um, as a representative uh, of a state administration, uh, or as representatives uh, on a whole, we have the duty uh, to conduct equal rights and to change the structural conditions. Uh, the German uh, constitution says that women and men are equal and that every German has the right to choose his or her profession freely. I totally agree with Bertha, who said that uh, everyone has to choose the profession he or she wants. I think this is always important for everybody, but I'm asking myself, why are professions for women so limited? Why do women and young women have a, a very limited range of uh, professions they want to, to choose? Uh, I think Al Alina and, Alina and, um, and Barbara po pointed it out uh, that maybe the forestry sector with, his, with its antiquated tradition isn't very attractive for young women with um, maybe other ambitions. Uh, and for this reason, besides uh, changing structural conditions, uh, and this implies as well uh, equal equality acts and programs for forestry institutions. This means financial support from structural funds because as Europeans or members of the European Union, we also have the duty uh, to um, 
mainstream gender into all structural funds and into the financial budgeting of, budgeting of the Euro European structural funds. Uh, and I think that uh, to that it, on the one hand, we as administrations have to comply with all uh, uh, these um, these efforts the European Union has made, and on the other hand, we have to try to uh, change uh, the image of the forestry sector and to have a more positive and inclusive image. Uh, I have tried to do so in some smaller projects. Um, I just mentioned um, that we did some gender mainstreaming uh, uh, studies on uh, public relations and how people are addressed, uh, how you use pictures uh, within your brochures. We did some gender mainstreaming studies on uh, environmental education and on socioeconomic monitoring. Uh, and I was hoping that the whole business, the forestry sector, was uh, grabbing at these studies and then uh, taking them further on in the policy making process. But unfortunately, I haven't seen that yet. At least I haven't seen it on the federal level. So we have to work. We definitely have to work on, on in this field. Thank you, Renate. Beth, would you agree with these observations? I, I would agree. And I think you asked, Alexander, if, um, if the pace of change is too slow. Absolutely, yeah. it's too <laughs> slow. Um, and, it, you know, there, there probably have been not just decades, but centuries of, of reasons um, that we are where we are with regard to the statistics. But for me, what I see is um, there's a lack of flexibility um, and this can be really very challenging, especially when it comes to those of us who are women who choose to have families, for instance, um, in male dominated areas. And a good example I found during this pandemic, um, women found it very difficult to in Canada, in some provinces, we actually had to keep our children home and school them at home. And it's difficult to be a full-time employee and, um, and a teacher to our children at the same time. Uh, there was something in the chat box that I want to raise. And it was uh, the number, I believe it had to do with um, publications by female authors. And I participated in uh, February in a STEM, a science, technology, engineering, mathematics panel. And I heard a shocking statistic that during the pandemic, if you actually compare the number of publications in the field of STEM, uh, where the primary author is female, during the COVID period, it has dropped, dropped by 19%. So this tells me that, you know, it's systemic. There are, um, there are, things that we must do not it's not about tar necessarily targets but really changing the culture to make it more inclusive but to allow it to be more resilient for women in particular whether they're in the forest sector operations um, in the woods in the mills in academia in government um, one thing that i try to do myself with young public servants in my department um, and, and I try to emphasize a little more the young women. I actually bring them to meetings with, with me and I actually give them opportunities to speak. And I turn to them to get their perspective as a young female public servant, because I want to make sure that the federal government in Canada uh, is a nurturing environment and a supportive environment and a safe environment for them. So I would say, um, how do we create change? For me, it was, it was actually direction from the very top uh, from our prime minister's office that put such an emphasis on diversity and inclusion. And we've, we've implemented that throughout the department, but I tie it 
to things that count. Not only is it the right thing to do, but if you tie it to funding and specific programming programs, then people are actually, unfortunately, almost forced to do it. But it does bring about change if you tie it to something that counts. And often money counts for our stakeholders. Thank you. Thank you very much, Beth. Um, and you mentioned the money, and uh, that reminded me of a conversation I had earlier with Gun, who actually re referred to some of the, the hidden the hidden barriers. And some of those also have to do with, with funding. Uh, Gun, uh, perhaps uh, you would like to very briefly elaborate on this before we open the discussion for the for to the audience. I already see many comments and questions in the chat box, so I guess we will have some uh, a good amount of questions also for the for the discussion with the participants. But Gun, please. Yes, that's right. I mean, the, the, there has been um, several, uh, I would say, studies on, <clears throat> on how research grants uh, are distributed among research teams. And, and um, although um, our public institutions or, or um, funds uh, um, have tried to um, to make their their um, distribution gender neutral, different they have used different means to do it. Uh, still, we can see uh, that the pattern remains. Maybe not as it used to be two decades ago when Agnes Wold and um, Agneta Wenders published their uh, quite uh, important. Um, article in science, actually, uh, about um, how these systems work. Uh, but, um, but still, um, there are these patterns. And um, one, there is one word that I specifically used to pay attention to. And that, that is when people start to talk about excellence. Uh, because behind this, behind and beyond this label of excellence, uh, which uh, usually is not explained, it's kind of taken for granted that if you are excellent, then you should have the money or you should have the credits or whatever. But uh, this has become a word uh, also that really has to be deconstructed. And we have to, to, to find out uh, what excellence means in a specific setting. Um, and uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not arguing against the use of, or that excellent, if you behave excellent, you should be promoted. But we have to know what it means uh, in a specific situation. Um, so that is, that is one thing. Um, also, um, uh, speaking about excellence, um, it, my impression is that it usually means that you are very specialized. <laughs> you have a very, a rather narrow, but very deep knowledge in something. Uh, while... And that this has been mentioned um, in this round of talks that uh, it seems that, that women usually have a more holistic view on, for example, forestry or what forest is or what we should use the forest for. And, and, and that is, uh, I would say, not that often recognized as being excellent. To be holistic or have a holistic view is, is encouraged somehow, but it never renders this excellence <laughs> label. And um, also that, that um, uh, I mean, my, my argument here is that, of course, we need both. We need those who really are specialists in something and can deep, dig, uh, dig deep in, uh, in, in a subject. But we also, and to a larger extent, me needs people who have a broader 
and more holistic view um, because um, as Renate said, we, it was stated already in this <clears throat> document from the Visu conference, forest area is uh, as much about people as about trees, meaning that it's about society and how we as a society deals with these natural resources and those who work and live in and by the resource. Thank you so thank you so much, Gun. I think it's really important to keep also that in mind that sometimes you know the barriers for achieving a more gender equality in forestry are very hidden and sometimes even terms and programs that sound very nice, <laughs> very excellent, actually may have a, a detrimental effect on, 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 on gender equality uh, discussions. So thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we have now heard from the panelists, and it is now actually your turn to ask questions or make comments. We do have a little less than half an hour for that purpose. Uh, let me briefly explain the procedure. In case you would like uh, to ask a question or make a comment, you can signal your interest by clicking the raise hand button on Zoom. You can find that button, I think, towards the bottom right uh, corner of, of the Zoom interface. Alternatively, you can also post a question in the chat box and quite a few of you have already posted questions or comments in the chat box. I will try to take up as many questions or comments as possible, but because of that, I would also like to ask each and every one of you to be as brief as possible. And when being given the floor, uh, please uh, let us know your name and affiliation. Please also indicate which of the panelists, if any, your question is addressed to. And as you take the floor, please also uh, feel welcome to switch on your camera if you would like to. So the floor is open and I ask participants to raise their hands. I cannot yet see any hands. I'm not sure if that is a technical issue or if you are indeed being a little bit shy. Please let us not be shy. I think Andrea said that very elaborately. We need to be courageous and speak up. Uh, so don't be shy. Ah, and I can already see a hand. Uh, uh, and that is Monica Hernandez Morquillo. Monica, the floor is yours. Hello, thank you, Alexander. Thank you all for this very interesting uh, debate and conversation. I posted a question in the chat. I will repeat it here. So uh, this is directed to Gun. Um, yeah, uh, and it's related to the fact that uh, it seems that creating women networks uh, have a danger also of, as you already stated, perpetuating this division of gender. And now uh, we are a group in Spain of around 200 women that we are thinking on maybe create this type of network, but we wonder whether this could be uh, something positive to us or this would be not uh, the right move to do, given the fact that maybe we will be suspicious of doing things that we mm, yeah, can perpetuate this difference. So at the end, it's like a bit of a trap. And we wonder we, what could be the most successful strategy to balance gender in our sector, in particular in, in Spain. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Monica. The question was addressed to Gun. Gun, would you like to uh, respond right away or should, would you prefer me to take another question before you respond? As you wish. Then, let's, then let's go ahead. <laughs> mm, okay. Um, I think that uh, network, creating network is a good idea. Um, but um, you should be aware of... Um, the strategy and agree on the strategy 
I mean, on one hand, you can ha you can create networks that that works very well internally, strengthen your identity, strengthen your uh, your professional uh, yeah your professional identity, and um, so that is one good thing by creating networks. Um, uh, but if uh, the other strategy, um, sometimes them can be combined, but is if you really would like to raise gender equality issues, I mean, in the sense that um, similar to some of the Swedish uh, women forest mm -hmm. uh, owners networks, um, or uh, like the other one, the NYX, uh, then you will probably experience more of resistance and you will be questioned. And, and so you have to be prepared for that. <laughs> uh, what the, the good situation now is that there are so many uh, women, uh, forest, women in forestry networks around the world today. So you can, um, you can connect to a wider net of networks and be supported and to find your strategy that, that fits you in the best way. Um, but as I said, um, once you started to challenge the norms and the, the privilege, um, then you will also experience that um, resistance. That is So um, uh, I hope that this conference also give you some further insights and inspiration in how to do and, and with whom to connect. And yes, I think it's um, personally, I would say that the network, uh, networking with Renate, for example, um, with this a team of specialists on gender and forestry and others in these networks where uh, which was um, established basically because of the uh, the women conference in Beijing uh, 1995 when when uh, the governments uh, of different countries um, agreed on gender mainstreaming as a policy uh, is yeah, it's bearing fruits actually, and um, step by step, um, things are improving. And the fact these networks, I would say, uh, is part of part of the work. Uh, yeah. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Gun. Um, so basically, I would argue this conference, which brings together so many participants from around the globe, could be a first step towards creating a more international network of women in forestry. Perhaps the starting point. I see that there are two hands up. Uh, the first person is Merete Larsman. Uh, Merete, the floor is yours. Uh, hello, hello, and thank you for this uh, nice uh, event. First of all, my name is Merete and I have my experience from uh, women in forestry in Norway since the first year, 1986. First of all, I want to say very much thanks to Gunn Lidestav, who, has, who is doing this research, uh, research on behalf of female foresters and also uh, I would say that the whole uh, society because she is uh, she's doing a very very uh, valuable uh, work for us uh, my experience from women in forestry is the same as gun is describing but we just need to open up and make uh, the more networks we can make uh, in all levels uh, i think the better i have worked 30 years in official administration and also 10 years in private forestry and the experience my experiences are the same as for uh, very many of you but uh, first of all we need to go in front with the research and the opinions so thank you for this um, 
very interesting uh, conference. Thank you, Marita. I take it that this was really more of a comment rather than a question. Um, I can see that uh, there are a, a few more hands up. Uh, very good. And it seems that now we are going really international uh, because I believe the next person comes from Sierra Leone, Kadiyatu. I'm almost certain I mispronounced that name. Kadiyatu <laughs> Sheriff, uh, the floor is yours. <laughs> Let yes, us know how um, to pronounce the name properly. <laughs> it's, it's, that's right. It's Kadiyatu Sheriff. <laughs> <laughs> so you're correct. Um, it's basically like a comment or a suggestion um, is for Alina from Finland, um, representing IFSA. Yes, um, I actually have a very good network with um, the IFSA body. I was um, once a student at um, Jala University and now I am a researcher and teaching assistant at the university. And it's happened that I have um, engaged in some IFSA work here in Sierra Leone. I introduced IFSA in Sierra Leone and it's going on successfully and we are trying our best. But um, there are a few challenges, especially when it comes to female students, you know, to so even see female students in the front line engaging in IFSA activities is not common. You know, when you as a female, you want to try your best, you, you, you want to bring like fellow colleagues on board to talk to them about forestry. Some of them I look at it and see what's happening and what is she talking about. So in 20, um, North Africa Regional um, meeting and I was the head of OC organizing for NAM 19 in Sierra Leone. It was successful, but it was challenging because one, I was a female and to see a female heading a whole um, conference like that was something that many of our female students did see themselves doing. So I'm kind of like um, suggesting that, especially in Africa, um, female students are kind of shy and some of them, um, like I said in my comment, they want to come into forestry. They want to engage themselves. They, they want to learn, they want to choose it as a career, but they didn't, they are not finding it necessary. Why should I? They are not finding enough networks for them, enough encouragement, okay? So if, if, if SAC can as well focus on um, students, especially encouraging female students from Africa or around the world, um, bringing them together, encouraging and empowering them, I think it might help a bit because IFSA is like um, the student body for forestry students across the world. So if um, female students who are in Africa or across the world can see themselves, you know, networking with other students how they see themselves relevant in the forestry sector out there, I think it will be better and they will have more confidence in themselves and know that the career is not just about going to the forest and cutting down trees. So they have a stake even in the international world. They have people they can connect with, they have people they can liaise with, they have people they can meet at any time and network with, yeah. So thank you. Thank you, Karijatu, for, for this important observation. And if I may add, in my profession as, as at UFRA, I've always been impressed by the vibrancy of the activities of IFSA, especially in Africa. Mm -hmm. So and, uh, I'm very pleased to meet you because obviously you have been one of the drivers behind those activities. Thank you. <laughs> Alina, can I ask if there anything you would like to uh, comment on or re respond to? with regard uh, to, uh, to, to this uh, contribution? Um, sure, I can comment shortly. Uh, thank you, Karichatu. It's, it's very great that you have been a part of IFSA and that you have been a driver of IFSA activities in, in Africa. Um, I, I, I'm very, I know that we are not present in many countries in Africa, but it is 
a rising, um, it, it is a rising region, and we hope that we will also um, be of more importance, and, is, and especially through IFSA, be, be able to empower women in uh, Africa to participate more in forestry, to choose this career, and hope that this will um, this will change in future in in better direction. Sure. Thank you very much, Kadichatu and Alina. We do have uh, two more requests sure. on the floor. And I think after that, um, we might actually, uh, again, um, you know, um, return to our panelists for the concluding statements. But before we do that, I would like to give the floor to Suchita Dakal. Please, Suchita, briefly introduce yourselves. Tell us where do you come from? Uh, namaste and greetings, everyone. Namaste. <laughs> I am Sujita Dakar from Nepal. So I work for Recoff Nepal Country Program and also I am associate uh, for Female Foresters Network Nepal. So uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizing team and all the panelists uh, for such, an, uh, such a wonderful uh, session. Uh, what I would like is, uh, in case of Nepal, uh, we see a lot of hostility uh, towards women at universities and workplace. This is very much prevalent. So I will be requesting panels to give me suggestions to address this issue. Also, I also would love to know how to garner more male allies together uh, for the gender parity at workplace, uh, because as we all know, gender equality is not only about women. And I want uh, our male counterparts also on the same pace. So I would love to hear your suggestions. That's it. Thank you so much. Danyavat uh, Sujita. Uh, colleagues, these have been two rather kind of uh, grand questions, if I may say so. So really how to counter that hostility, uh, you know, faced by female students and also how to support them in the workplace. I wonder who of you would like to respond to Sujita's questions? Beth, maybe based on the experiences in Canada, since it seems that, you know, there's a role clearly of government and governance in all this, do you think some of the experiences gained in Canada could be replicated also in a cultural context like Nepal in this case? That, that's perhaps I an would... even grander question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure, but I think... Uh, I think what we're looking at is is some best practices, and I would hope that um, Sujita, some of these best practices could be applied in other contexts and other countries. But for me, I think, uh, in my own personal approach, um, is I try to bring everyone who's in that ecosystem into the solution making process, including men. I, we're not gonna change things and improve the situation if we exclude men, I don't think. So you identify the ones that are the influencers who are your allies, who can help you bring about this cultural change to make it a more um, uh, welcoming, attractive, safe workplace. I, I would start from there. Thank, Thank you, you very so much. Thank you very much for your insights. Excellent. Uh, and then there we do have uh, one other request for the floor. Alice uh, Kosati from Austria and Sweden. Alice, uh, please let us know your question or comment. Yeah, hello. Um, so I'm actually a student right now in forest sciences in Austria and Sweden. And I have more like a, of a comment or statement to say. So I think we should really use the opportunity of these two days to really uh, organize together because it's very important in my opinion that especially we organize across different ages and experiences because only if we collectively decide to move forward and to change the structures and to build structures that are in some hand some kind uh, different from the prevailing ones only then we can also change the system and another thing that has been missing for me in this discussion until now was the discussion about masculinities, because, of course, yes, we as women or non-binary people, we need to organize, we need to uh, network and take action. 
But if we don't deconstruct certain masculinities and certain norms, then in my opinion, there will not be a change in this forestry structures, which are uh, built on very strong stereotypes. So I would like to hear from some of the panel, what do you think about how we could also take in the discourse of masculinities and deconstruct these gender norms? Thank you. Thank you very much, Alice. Um, so uh, could I ask uh, who would like to respond to Alice's question? Kun, please. <laughs> I can do so. Uh, well, to, to start at least. Uh, yes, I, when, uh, when I, I, together with, uh, at that time, uh, Merete Fureberg from Norway established uh, uh, <coughs> the um, research group, UFRA research group, uh, Gender and Forestry in 2000, uh, we stated then that um, gender, we should work as much with issues regarding masculinities as with femininities and, and the two gender issues. Um, similar to, to gender studies in general, there is kind of a, a nine to one um, distribution. Uh, so still much more research is done and activities is than about women and femininity than about masculinity. And I think that this is part of the, pro the problem that we are progressing slow. Uh, not until recently, I, I see that uh, there are grants, you can, you can get research grants on uh, to study masculinity in forestry, actually, for example. Um, uh, but uh, just to mention, let's say the, that that I think that there is a, there there are some openings uh, in this respect. Um, also, about that time in two thousand, um, I uh, used by using ethnographical methods, I collected uh, stories, narratives from from women uh, forest owners, and and I made a book together with some colleagues really uh, in ethnographical research and, and so such things. And it became kind of a, a popular science book for, for uh, forest owner associations to use um, in their study circles, which is a kind of Scandinavian concept, how to peer-to-peer -peer learning. Uh, and once it was ready and we launched it, then there was the CEO of one of the major um, uh, forest owner associations in, in Sweden who said there should be a book like this about men forest owners as well. So I think that there is, in that sense, it's not that much of a resistance. I mean, how to start to work with, with these issues. Um, and and um, let's say... Um, Bring, bring those issues about men and masculinity in forestry on, on the, the table. And if I may so then, um, um, raise a question to Alexander. <laughs> may I? Please, uh, please. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the question goes like this. Have you ever experienced a conference like this with men mostly and if so if not um, how would it look like <laughs> this is a this is a, a very good question Gun. I, you know what i can of course state with utmost confidence that i have experienced very many conferences that were dominated by men in terms of participation but also in terms of the inputs they gave but what i can also do is i would like to actually take a one comment that has just been posted in the chat and that is that also you know there are several men or i would say quite many men who do not feel entirely comfortable with these notions of masculinity that dominate the sector and that would very much actually support efforts as you uh, advocated for Gun to do gender actually instead of defining the gender discussions only by the sex 
of um, you know of the participants. And I would actually state again that I would uh, be one of those. I am one of those who does not feel comfortable with those uh, traditional gender roles, um, and therefore have a very high interest in not having those reproduced uh, in the future. That was kind of an answer, I guess, to your question, Gun. Um, colleagues, I'm afraid we are slowly running out of time uh, for this for this dialogue. Um, nevertheless, uh, you know, and we have really had heard a, a wealth of experiences, ideas, and views. Nevertheless, I would like to ask each and every one of our six panelists to just, if possible, say in one sentence what you took away from this dialogue. What the most important point is that you took away from this conversation. And then I would uh, wrap up uh, the, the discussion. So perhaps um, we could again go this in the same uh, order as we did in the first round and again start with our forestry practitioners, Andrea and Berta. So what is the, the one point, the one sentence that you take away from this discussion? Also, okay, gut. Äh, Habe ich mitgenommen. Ich glaube, äh, wir müssen uns alle noch besser vernetzen. Wir müssen äh, uns alle noch sichtbarer machen. Äh, für mich persönlich ist For me personally, I tend to say that it is not sufficient or it is a good start to have such a conference like the one today. Basically, we should deepen the exchange of opinions, but equality is not easy to pinpoint. We have to live it. And here I am referring to the following. We have to be more visible. We have to dare to take a step forward. Regarding the networking, I can only recommend an our chairwoman, Dagma, in, we are represented in all areas and we are on the same eye to eye level. We also have men in our network, but we don't gender because it has to be the case. But it is part of the discussion to lead a discussion on an eye to eye level. Only doing so takes us a step forward. Thank you. Alberta. Bertha, I think you are muted. Ich glaube, Sie sind gemutet. Stimmt. Ja, Entschuldigung. Ich hab, ich hab gesagt, That's right. I'm sorry. I said that this is not easy for women to put it down to one sentence. For me, it has been a pleasant surprise that so many that there are so many networks. I think it would be, we would be well advised to network together across the globe. And by doing so, taking part and being vocal about it during the process, being confident and live forestry. And creating it and instead of waiting and complaining but we have to stay take a step forward hereby the networks could be a good help i don't think that this is as recognized that there were um, many networks thank you very much Beata. alina yes thank you um, I think the main takeaway is that um, we should be able to discuss this, not only within uh, ourselves and within women, but within men and everyone. This should be a topic that can be openly addressed and we shouldn't be afraid of it. And these, these discussions should start from universities, should start right away when you enter the forestry field as a student and should continue all the way through the careers and 
uh, appear in every workplace and uh, organization that is part of the forestry sector. Thank you very much, Alina. Renate. What I will take home from this panel discussion is that the future of women in forestry and gender in the sector, let's say the next 20 years will be bright, shining, international and young. We will try to change traditions. We will reach a more positive and inclusive image of the forestry sector. We will have equality acts and programs, financial support and scientific research on gender issues. Renate, thank you so much. I think you have read out the vision statement for the future global network for women in forestry. <laughs> this is why, uh, because I am leaving uh, my job now within the next two months. So I am officially through with my uh, work. Uh, time and now I will have a more private uh, balance of of work. <laughs> but remember, so I hope I hope <laughs> that the point where we started some 30, 35 years ago, uh, prolonged into the future, might have uh, another conference, maybe in Austria, maybe in Canada, maybe in Sierra Leone, uh, where we have to sum up and. Uh, have to thank you that you were the ones to, who uh, took now the opportunity for this uh, online uh, conference. Thank you very so thanks much. Thanks again. Renate. Beth, when can we all come to Canada? <laughs> <laughs> I hope we can travel soon. Uh, thank you to, to my fellow panelists. This has been just great. I think my takeaway is that we are not alone. There are more female leaders trying to affect change in the forest sector than we realize. So let's stay connected and let's keep sharing our stories. Thank you. Thank you very much, Beth. And last but certainly not least, uh, Gun. Yes. Um, uh, what I, um, I was more kind of, not visionary uh, like <laughs> Renate. Um, it's more on a personal, um, yeah, but also professional level. I would say that uh, what I ta take home is the inclusive atmosphere uh, of this conference. Um, it's not a surprise because it is usually. It, my experience when on women and forest conferences is that it's, it's such a nice, good atmosphere. People are so willing to share experience and to discuss without uh, prestige. Um, and then when it comes to still a bit in the future, I hope that uh, at the Euphro Congress in in Stockholm 2024, um, we as the task force on gender and forestry uh, are able to, to see a lot of you uh, coming to the, to the Congress uh, and to be part of some uh, activities and events that we are planning. Thank you so much. Gun, that is actually also my hope. And I, I'm confident to say that this is also the hope of the president of UFRO, who is also still online. So we heard very clearly, Gun, what you've just said with a view to Stockholm 2024. Colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, um, I must say that um, I'm impressed by the fact that we still have 235 participants online who have followed uh, this uh, stakeholder dialogue. I think this is truly impressive. I think you will agree with me that we had a highly stimulating dialogue about connecting and engaging women in the forest space sector. It has become clear that women continue to be underrepresented and that these current gender imbalances continue to have significant impact on forest practice, policy, education, and research. Therefore, I think you will also agree with me that it is necessary to accelerate efforts to do gender 
as Gun put it in her keynote presentation. At the same time, based on your experiences, our, based on your experiences, you, the, our six panelists, have demonstrated impressively how networking, mentoring, and awareness raising, as well as conducive policies and programs, can support women in forestry and bring about more lasting change. I would like to uh, sincerely thank uh, our six panelists for their excellent contributions and ask everyone to give them a warm applause by clicking, clicking the applause button of Zoom. I hope you can all find it. Perfect. And I would also like to thank very sincerely each and every one of you for having joined this stakeholder dialogue. I would also like to mention that the session has been recorded and will be made available on the YouTube channel of the Federal Research Center for Forests, the BFW, at youtube.com slash Waldforschung. And perhaps I could ask the organizers to post that link um, in, the, in the chat box. Uh, there have been very many comments and suggestions and excellent ideas posted in the chat box. So obviously there is an interest to continue that discussion. And the good news is that there is a possibility to do so in the networking session that will start at 18 hours um, a local time, 18 hours UTC plus two, um, immediately after the next program element. We will now take a five minute break, um, meaning that we will reconvene at five minutes past 17 hours UTC plus two. And, uh, and I encourage all of you to stay on for a very nice presentation entitled Forests in Fashion that will start at 17 or five hours uh, CEST or UTC plus two. So please stay posted for this very nice presentation. And once more, a big thanks to everyone. Bye bye. And back to our moderator, Hermine. Vielen herzlichen Dank. Thank you very much. I am absolutely speechless because I am absolutely amazed by the arguments and statements that came from the panel. Thank you very much for this excellent discussion and also for the excellent moderation on behalf of Alexander Buck. As he has just said, we will meet each other again in five minutes and move on to the to the last point of our event.